what he's saying is that the Islamic organizations in the Middle East, Iran and Saudi Arabia, Qatar, etc., have been funding people like Kamala Harris and all these other, uh, you know, so-called progressives and extremists and the Democratic Party. And they've been doing it for decades and it's finally paying off because now they're getting the support of the left towards Islamic causes. So they have bought off the left. So can we say that using petrodollars, I'm just paraphrasing what you said, using petrodollars, the Islamic world has bought off the left. Initially, the Islamists allied with the socialists and the communists in Iran in order to overthrow the Shah government. And then immediately after they won, they invited all of the communist and socialist leaders to a big gala dinner to celebrate, and they murdered them all. When they are a minority, they are very kind. It's all about being working together, inclusiveness, you know, that was like hippie Muhammad, right? And then as soon as he got some power, what did he do? Rape pillage, murder, sex slaves, right? So that's that's when things change as soon as he becomes powerful. And the same thing just keeps on playing over and over and over and over again in countries all across the world. You see the exact same pattern happening. Once Muslims reach a certain uh, level of, of whether it be political power, a voting block, then that's when they suddenly start to make their demands. You can see this happening in real time in Canada right now. So up until this moment, Justin Trudeau, the Liberal government, NDP, everybody has been supporting the Muslim people so much, allowing them to do anything that they wanted because they were just begging for their votes, pandering for their votes. And so they were letting, when they said, we don't want to have... Um, sexual education in schools, they said, okay, no problem. They said, we want to have uh, Friday prayer rooms in our schools. Okay, no problem. We don't want our kids to go to have to go to school or take tests or anything during Ramadan. Okay, no problem. Anything they wanted, they got it. And now they are demanding even more. Now they're saying, take out anything that has to do with homosexuality from the schools. Suddenly we have a problem. Because this is a, 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 a liberal, you know, cornerstone, LGBT equality. So how is he now, Justin Trudeau, who has spent all of these years pandering for the Muslim vote, suddenly he's at the point where it's like, what am I going to do? Am I going to allow Muslims what they're demanding and lose my, my you know, if he even has a value system? Um, and you can also see that happening with the war that's happening uh, in, in Israel and Gaza, because he's not coming out in 100%, because, of course, Canada is an ally of, of Israel. So he can't come out and just say, you know, uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free, Israel must be eradicated. And because he's not saying that, he's losing the Muslim votes. In fact, he went to a mosque last week. And he was booed. He couldn't even speak in the microphone because of all the people that were booing him and they wouldn't be quiet. Why do you think, see, the global left is supporting Islam? And I've been, you know, exposing this wokeism and so on, the axis of left and Islam and they brought in blacks and they brought in LGBTQ and tried to make a coalition to uh, topple the established order. Why do you feel the left supports Islam when there are so many contradictions? I mean, to be a true liberal, you wouldn't want to suppress women. Uh, you wouldn't want to do all these things that you, you had to suffer. Uh, and and, and uh, particularly women, uh, women who are liberated, uh, uh, which is the backbone of the whole leftist movement, are not even tolerated and accepted in Islam. So why do you think there is this hypocrisy of uh, Islam and, and the left towards each other when ideologically it's full of contradictions and full of uh, mutual conflict? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And it's one that I've spent a lot of time talking about, a lot of time thinking about. In fact, that is literally the subtitle of my book, How Western Liberals Empower Radical Islam. So uh, this book is, is, uh, is grappling with that question. So uh, as far as I can tell from having been born and raised in the West and hearing the uh, 
the way the media and the education system and just the way the culture acts here, we are very, you know, we are raised to never criticize other cultures, uh, never criticize other minority minority groups, because we have to be, uh, you know, it has to be all about diverse, diversity and inclusion. However, it is very okay. In fact, it is encouraged to criticize Western culture and in fact have hate towards Western culture to the point that in Canada for many years in a row, some Canadians have been insisting that we shouldn't even celebrate Canada Day. And I've seen the same thing happen in, on July 4th. Um, so there is this real almost obsessive need to support the minority groups even if those minority groups are espousing the most illiberal uh, edicts, they still cannot bring themselves to criticize them because that would make them Islamophobic, bigoted, racist, whatever, according to but here, here I want ideology. To, here, here I want to uh, uh, stop you and, and raise an issue. I come from a minority religion also, which is Hinduism, mm -hmm. but they don't do the same thing for us. I mean, in fact, uh, they are. I, I I feel that most liberals are Hindu phobic. They are very Hindu phobic. They're always accusing Hinduism of one thing or another, of the its treatment of women and caste and all that kind of stuff. Whereas Islamic society is filled with caste. I mean, they don't call it that, but Islamic society is filled with caste. Uh, certainly, Indian Muslims uh, and and uh, the the abuse of women. There's not no other religion as bad as Islam. But why is but this business about being a pro minority and uh, it does not extend it to other other faiths. It does not extend to uh, Hinduism. I mean, numerically, Jews are a minority. There are certainly fewer yeah. than Muslims are. So I think the liberals also have a bit of a hypocrisy on who is and who Absolutely. is not considered yeah. a minority. So I think the problem is. The, the liberals might want to explain it that way. It makes them feel good that we are pro-Islam because we like minorities and we hate ourselves and we hate our colonial past. But then the follow-up question has to be, well, then why don't you why don't you support the Jewish minority and the Hindu minority? What's wrong with them? So I think maybe it also has something to do with, and I want your opinion on this, it has to do with the very aggressive uh, overtures that the Muslim leaders from the Middle East gave towards to their patronage of the left. They funded the mm -hmm. left. left. The leftists are full, full of, uh, uh, they hire them, they give them money, they fund Harvard, uh, they fund uh, the liberal left on MSNBC. So they put all these uh, Muslims into uh, CNN uh, and, and uh, you know, MSNBC. They put them into think tanks. So the, the role of Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Iran, etc., in making incursions and really going and befriending the left has to be considered also as a factor. It's not just that the leftists are good people who like the underdog and they like minorities and therefore they're doing it. I would say that the Muslims have been very smart in, in uh, hacking the brains of the left and hacking their institutions and getting in with money and get, making them feel guilty. And they've trained, they must have trained a whole lot of people in madrasas on how to go and uh, kind of uh, infiltrate the leftist organizations and make them pro-Muslim. So what do you think of that aspect of where the Muslims I, have I, been very smart? I completely agree that that is most definitely a factor. And there's two things that I, I want to bring up here. Number one, when we saw all of those revolutions happening in Iran, you saw this problem because a lot of those Iranian lobbying groups they had been funding, I mean, they funded Kamala Harris, for example, as well as Ilhan Omar, as well as Rashida Tlaib. They funded, they have been funding um, democratic politicians campaigns for years. And, you know, we're talking about petrodollars now, you know, so they have some good funding coming from these places. And so there is definitely a factor in this. Um, so I think this is, I think this is worth repeating. What she's saying is that the Islamic organizations in the Middle East, Iran and Saudi Arabia, Qatar, etc., have been funding people like Kamala Harris and all these other, uh, you know, so-called progressives and extremists and the Democratic Party. 
and they've been doing it for decades and it's finally paying mm -hmm. off because now they're getting the support of the left uh, towards Islamic causes. So exactly. they have bought off the left. So can we say that using petrodollars, I'm just paraphrasing what you said, using petrodollars, the Islamic world has bought off the left. Yes. And I think that there's a third factor here as well, which is fear. Because terrorism works. Terrorism is successful. When people are going around with their trucks, just hitting people in Christmas parades or bombing Ariana Grande concerts or bombing the Bataclan Theater in France or just stabbing people in the streets of London, all of this terrorism that's happening in, in Belgium and Germany and everywhere, all of that forces people to stay quiet as well. And I'm going to mention even another factor. And that last factor, I think maybe not the last one, but another one of the main factors is that Muslims are a very large voting block. And so they want to keep the Muslims happy because they want them to vote Democrat. Yeah, that is that large factor is extremely important in democratic places like India where there's a large Muslim bloc. So I think if we look at the three or four factors, one is white, white liberal guilt. Mm -hmm. And so the, and the second is that the Muslims have navigated and managed this guilt, bought them off and said, OK, uh, you know, you can wash your guilt by uh, fighting against Islamophobia or what we think is Islamophobia, which means anybody who criticizes us, uh, you help us mm -hmm. intellectually. We are the street fighters. We will provide the physical fighting force. Uh, you know, the bullies on the streets and you provide the intellectual ammunition on media and, and the academy. And so there is a kind of a, a coalition uh, between the left, the global left and Islam, where Islam provides money, petrodollars. Uh, leftists don't have that, but they get this from the Islam. And, uh, and the leftists provide them with intellectual support, legal support, public relations, sophistication. Because, you know, I wouldn't expect that the mullahs have come up with very sophisticated theories at places like Harvard. I mean, they've used the, you use the leftists to do that job for them and they paid them for it. So you agree with that. And then the, then the other factor okay. is fear, uh, the, the fear of Islam. Uh, they put that fear in there. And of course, voting power, their, their political clout. Yeah. Now so now you see as a result of this, this. So as a result of this, as your book points out, the, the coalition of left and Islam has become a dangerous cocktail. And they are running many uh, governments, many people in governments, many uh, universities, the, the liberal arts universities, the Ivy Leagues are run that way, the think tanks, the media. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty serious problem facing those who are genuinely liberal, who want to ask questions, who want to mm -hmm. be able to critique anybody. I, I, I critique my own tradition and I let others critique my tradition and we have debates and I answer back. But we have no beheading or... Or, or uh, you know, criminalizing anybody who's criticizing or leaves our tradition. You can leave anything you want. Who cares? We just we just like to argue and debate. But I don't find that openness in the Muslims that I know, and I don't find that openness among the leftists I know. This is very strange. Mm -hmm. they, they've closed their minds also. So, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on this uh, leftist and Islam coalition? That seems to be dominating the world discourse right now. Yeah. So as they say, those who fail to repeat from history are doomed to repeat it. This alliance between the left and Islamists is not new. It has been done over and over and over again. In fact, that's why the Islamic regime is in power right now in Iran. Because initially, the Islamists allied with the socialists and the communists in Iran in order to overthrow the Shah government. And then immediately after they won, they invited all of the communist and socialist leaders to a big gala dinner to celebrate and they murdered them all. So that's exactly how this is going to play out. What you've just said is the Islam used radical Islam, the radical left, the Muslims in Iran used the left as useful idiots, useful exactly. idiots to help them do their job. Then they invited all of them to a big banquet and slaughtered them, murdered them because they right. now they become a nuisance. They should be eliminated. So that's what's going to happen We're to finished. the we liberals. They are they are mm -hmm. making a fool of themselves. 
the Muslims are a very old tradition, much older than the modern Marxism and so on. They know how to fight this battle. They, they are tough. They can withstand pain and they are doing it because they get a place in heaven. So that, that, is, that is a very powerful movement. And they are using the left. They are using them because the left is positioned in the academy, in media, in politics, and in, they are very sophisticated and well-educated. So they use the left uh, for intellectual warfare as intellectual warriors. But in the end, once the Muslims have taken control, it is not that the leftists will enjoy, they will be finished off and finished, you know. So this is a very important point that you just made. The things I feel is the strength of Islam in terms of being able to expand itself is their ability to talk in both, both sides. Mm. I mean, Muslims can, I know some of the most charismatic, some of the most interesting, brilliant people I, in my, I, as friends and people I come across are Muslims here in the United States, even in India, and they're very slick. I mean, whether mm -hmm. it's a Fareed Zakaria or the Ali mm. Wel Welsi in uh, uh, MSNBC uh, or many others, they're very slick, very articulate. They know how to agree with you. They know how to seem like they're self-critical and they're criticizing Islam. But that's kind of a hypocrisy because they'll never go deep enough. Uh, and, and so what do you think of that? How, how did Muslims become so smart without, without having been taught uh, critical thinking skills? I mean, they, it, it's very bizarre that the tradition well, which is so close-minded has also produced some very brilliant people. So when Hassan al-Banna started the Muslim Brotherhood, which is you know one of the strongest uh, Islamist movements over the, the 80s and early 90s, um, when he first started it, he encouraged Muslim Brotherhood members to have their children in the West. He said, we can never infiltrate the West because we are not from the West, we are not of the West. We don't understand how they think and we don't understand what they need to hear. But if you have your children in the West, have them all over Europe and North America and raise them in these societies, then they will know how to use diplomacy and secular laws against their, their, own, their own people, against the, the, the country that we're talking about. And that was a very smart strategy and it was very successful. And you'll see his uh, grandson taught at Ramadan was huge, you know, until he all of his rape charges came forward. But he was all over CNN. He was all over any French media, Swiss media. I mean, he was the, the face of Islam in, in the Europe and North America for so many years. Um, and, and you'll see the same thing with Linda Sarsour in the United States. You know, there's so many Islamists who know how to talk the talk and walk the walk because they know how to use the jargon of the left and they know how to play the game. They know how to but use you know, the right words that they need to hear. Right. So I think you've raised a very important point that uh, uh, Islamic strategists said that uh, those who are orthodox cannot impress the West. You need people who are already westernized, uh, who, are, who are Muslims that are raised in the West, that understand the West from within. This is a lesson that Hindus haven't learned. They keep sending orthodox people, keep sending shakha products, keep sending their own kind, thinking that they will be able to do this, not realizing that those who are westernized Hindus already, who are, who are raised in a Western system in schooling and so on, but who are deep down Hindus, they are the ones that you need to take on the West because they understand what the West is. So I think the Hindus can learn a lesson from the way the Muslims have ta tackled the West and tackled the lib liberal left uh, in, in, in the West. Because actually, if you think about it, when it comes to beliefs and, and principles and ideologies, it play, something like Hinduism is far more compatible with the left. I mean, the whole leftist into animal rights and vegetarianism and all this meditation and yoga, all of this, which characterizes the, the kind of liberal values, these come from India. Uh, but Indians have not capitalized on this, uh, you know, and have not understood how to talk, the, how to speak properly, how to articulate properly, how to debate properly and influence the West. And the, the, okay. the, our, our community has not supported the right kind of spokesmen and right kind of thinkers to do that. But Muslims have had this belief, have had this brilliant breakthrough on how to uh, influence the West.
But I'll I'll take a second issue. No, no, I, I have to I have to I have to let's let's just stop here for a moment because it's very important to make this this distinction. What you're talking about is just sharing your culture or sharing your ideas on how to on Hinduism and and how to be a Hindu person. But what Islamists are doing is they are trying to spread the nation of Allah. They are trying to make this whole planet a caliphate and to make everybody a Muslim. So it, it, it's it's not, it, it's very different. You know, they may be using, as you're suggesting, Hindu people can use the same strategy, but we have to understand that the goals of these Islamists is annihilation of Western culture. You know, it's right. not about yeah, that way, I'm helping that... you to understand Muslims. No, right. it's about I am in infiltrating your governments and I'm infiltrating your institutions because I want to turn it all Islamic. Yeah, that is something Hindus don't have. We, do, we have no mandate yeah. from God or anybody to turn the whole world into our point of view. We believe in mutual respect. We respect you, but you must respect us. And we have no problem with diversity and you can worship and pray any deity you want. We are pretty open to that. There is no such thing as a caliphate equivalent in Hindu, Hindu dharma. So we are we don't have that agenda to begin with. That's and that's an issue. Mm -hmm. Now here I want to also ask you, uh, Islam, when Muslim when liberal Muslims or pseudo liberal Muslims talk in a nice way, they're able to quote parts of the Quran to support their ideas that you know Quran praises everybody and you should you should love everyone and all that. Now is it true that the Quran surahs can be divided into Makkah and Medina and very different? And the Makkah mm -hmm. surahs were very nice and very liberal towards other people. And the Mad Mad Medina ones were very intolerant. And so the skillful, educated uh, Muslim uh, intellectual knows which surahs to bring in a given context. So when he's, when he's trying to impress the liberal West, he, he quotes from the, uh, from the Quran very selectively, where it says that everybody should be respected and we are tolerant and all the people are great. And, you should never harm anyone, all those nice things that liberals like to hear. And when they're trying to rabble rouse their own people to go and fight against others, they use the other kind of uh, surahs. Do you feel that is the case? And what are your thoughts on that? Because that's a sign of hypocrisy. Yes, and that, that is naturally what happens. And if you look at the, uh, the life of Prophet Muhammad, which we all had to learn about, it follows the exact same trajectory. When they are a minority, they are very kind. It's all about being working together, inclusiveness. You know, that was like hippie Muhammad, right? And then if, as soon as he got some power, what did he do? Rape, pillage, murder, sex slaves, right? So that's that's when things change as soon as he becomes powerful. And the same thing just keeps on playing over and over and over and over again in countries all across the world. You see the exact same pattern happening. Once Muslims reach a certain uh, level of, of whether it be political power, a voting bloc, then that's when they suddenly start to make their demands. You can see this happening in real time in Canada right now. So up until this moment, Justin Trudeau, the Liberal government, NDP, everybody has been supporting the Muslim people so much allowing them to do anything that they wanted because they were just begging for their votes, pandering for their votes. And so they were letting, when they said, we don't want to have um, sexual education in schools, they said, okay, no problem. They said, we want to have uh, Friday prayer rooms in our schools. Okay, no problem. We don't want our kids to go to have to go to school or take tests or anything during Ramadan. Okay, no problem. Anything they wanted, they got it. And now they are demanding even more. Now they're saying, take out anything that has to do with homosexuality from the schools. Suddenly we have a problem because this is a, 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 a liberal, you know, cornerstone, LGBT equality. So how is he now, Justin Trudeau, who has spent all of these years pandering for the Muslim vote, suddenly he's at the point where it's like, what am I gonna do? Am I going to allow Muslims what they're demanding? and lose my, my you know, if he even has a value system. Um, and you can also see that happening with the war that's happening uh, in, in Israel and Gaza, because he's not coming out and 100%, because of course, Canada is an ally of, of Israel. So he can't come out and just say, you know, 
uh, from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free, Israel must be eradicated. And because he's not saying that, he's losing the Muslim votes. In fact, he went to a mosque last week and he was booed. He couldn't even speak in the microphone because of all the people that were booing him and they wouldn't be quiet. So this is, so what, this happens. is what happens. This is what happens when there's hypocrisy and an artificial forced synthesis of, th of things that are incompatible. But what you try to make a synthesis out of them by forcing them, it eventually smart people will come and break it up. Smart opponents will come and put enough pressure. So now I, I'm told in a lot of places, Muslim women and LGBTQ activists are having a fight. And they're having a fight mm -hmm. in school districts in the United States uh, because the mm -hmm. left is so deeply uh, entrenched with the LGBTQ movement. And the Muslims, it's so radical, the Muslim Islam is so dramatically against it that you cannot pretend that they're all together in this woke thing. This woke has to fall apart because of these kind of contradictions within the different uh, uh, partners that have come together as a woke movement. So that's- yes, uh, but that's they were uh, very quiet and they played along up until they reached a strong voting number and now they've switched. So now the- Islam will go from a soft pace to a hard pace wherever it thinks it's able to do that. And that's where you'll see more and more of this happening. So uh, another uh, uh, front that Islam has started is halal. Mm -hmm. I mean, the halal movement is a multi-billion dollar mm -hmm. industry which uh, Muslim, Muslims control certification of who gets to be certified as halal. And it's not just for meat, but all foods and not yeah. just for foods, but also clothes and cosmetics and so on. So now they've managed to, uh, in the name of uh, trying to, you know, uh, spread uh, religious diversity, they got into halal, halal as an option. When halal became an option, then they forced their way such that halal is the only food being served on many Indian airlines, Indian airlines run by Hindus. Halal is the only option. Most Indian restaurants in the United States, if you go and ask them, do, is all your food halal? They'll say yes. And they've done it because of a minority of people who demanded that halal, but they are very proud in advertising halal. So if I as a Hindu want something which is non-halal because I consider halal to be an offense to my faith, it's not available even from Hindu establishments. Even Baba Ramdev, considered a very sort of right-wing Hindu, his products, his Ayurvedic products are halal because he wants to sell them in the Middle East. So if you look at the brilliance of with which the Muslim strategists have spread their faith, one of them is this certification of, of halal. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, India is what, 20% Muslim or, or something like that? They do the same thing in countries like Australia. I have people writing me letters from Australia telling me my son's school cafeteria is now 100% halal because we had one student say that they want to have halal food. In South Africa, there was a Burger King that accidentally sold a man a burger with bacon in it, and he made a big deal. Oh, I was throwing up all night. I couldn't. Oh, da, 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 da. And so Burger King in all of South Africa decided, okay, we're going to take out bacon off of our menu. So now nobody can enjoy a bacon double cheeseburger <laughs> because they don't want to have bacon. You can't just be, you can't just say like, no bacon, please. You know what I mean? <laughs> but no, everybody needs to follow your way. The yeah, boy in the cafeteria can't just simply choose, don't have meat. No, 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 no. Everybody must follow this one person's demands. Right. And that's because, you know, they've used this term Islamophobia very strategically right. by accusing people of Islamophobia for all kinds of things. I mean, if, if you don't serve me my halal meat, my halal food, I'm going to call you Islamophobic. So the people are afraid. Yes. They don't know. Firstly, they don't have enough knowledge about Islam and what is Islamophobia and what is not. And they don't have the courage. They don't have the audacity to push back and say, hey, listen, you're full of shit. You don't you. Uh, have no right to impose that I should eat your diet. You can eat your diet wherever you want. I don't want, even yeah. need to serve it to you because you're not serving Hindu vegetarian in your mosque. 
I mean, if I yeah, if, if is... you were to go, if if we were to reverse this and go to a Muslim establishment somewhere, a Muslim mm -hmm. airline or a Muslim restaurant, mm -hmm. and demand that we want absolutely pure sattvic Jain sattvic food, they don't have it. But we are not the kind who will demand, hey, you become Hindu phobic and all that. So this is the this is the power of being a nuisance of being organized and and uh, uh, constantly being on the run, on 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 an aggressive path to expand. That's what. They're, yeah. they're benefiting from having done that for decades. The term is cry bully, like a cry baby, but a cry bully. So they are bullies, but at the same time, they are being victims. And this brings me back to that very first question you asked me at the beginning of this segment. You said, what is the biggest problem with Islam? And the answer to that is the superiority. This belief that Muslims are superior to all other Muslims or to all other human beings, that is the most toxic part of the religion. And everything that we have talked about today falls under that umbrella. So if they didn't believe that they were superior and what they want is what's most important and everybody else needs to just deal with it, then you wouldn't be seeing this. You would be seeing more of a, of a liberal live and let live. You eat what you want to eat. I'll eat what I want to eat. You'll live how you want to live. I'll, you pray how you want to pray. But no, that's not the way Islam works. Islam, the definition of the word Islam is submission. That's the definition. You yeah, must submission, submit to Islam. Yeah, but submission is one's own submission, not making other people submit. So the, no, uh, it's... What do, what do the what do the Muslims do when they are conquering countries? Right? They say either become a Muslim or get your throat cut. You know, and if you want to pay jizya, which is a, a tax, it's only allowed if you're Christian or Jewish. Then you can stay alive, practice your religion, and pay us tax, like the mafia, basically pay us protection so that we won't hurt you. But if you're a polytheist. If you're Hindu, if you're Zoroastrian, if you're any, you know, all the other thousands of religions, immediately you just get killed. So this is a this is this has been a very interesting conversation, and we'll have some more. Uh, Yasmin, I want to thank you for it. Uh, do you have? I mean, I want to appeal to my viewers that you should go check out her website, uh, check out her handle on social media, and make an informed decision. If you'd like to support them, please go ahead and support them. I wanted to support her because I felt she's very sincere. She's lived a whole life uh, paying the price of being an honest with herself, sticking her neck out and now wanting to help other people. There are not too many people who are doing that. And it's not because I have a gripe against Islam per se. I just like to champion people who are heroes, who can stand against the overwhelming odds. Imagine, imagine her husband is an Al-Qaeda operative. Imagine her mother uh, uh, marries a second per uh, in her second marriage, gets a stepfather for her who is a radical Muslim, and she's being imposed all these kind of things. Uh, and now she wants to fight against it very successfully, becomes an ex-Muslim very publicly, and now she's helping other people. So I thought that's a very moving story and a powerful story, and more people should be uh, encouraged to uh, sort of look at this as a role model. So I, I want to tell that to people, but I want you to have the last uh, point. What would you like what is your final message to my viewers? What would you like them to know? I would love to end this on a final message of hope. Uh, so one of the other organizations that I'm the co-founder of and co-director is called the Clarity Coalition. And my co-director is a Muslim. So I'm an ex-Muslim, I should be killed, and he's a Muslim. But we work together in this coalition. We work together with Jewish people, atheist people, Hindu people, Christian people, everybody. We all work together. And we all work together with a common goal of pushing back against Islamists and their tyranny, whether it's in the West or globally, whether it's the ones that want to do it without violence or the ones that want to do it with the violence. So all of us recognize that this is a common enemy that we all have. And so what I want to end with is, you know, a lot of people feel like, uh, you know, th they're going crazy. You know, they can't express themselves because they're getting shut down. Uh, they, they don't even want to say what they feel because they're afraid to get canceled. But the truth is, there are so many of us out there 
and we are stronger together. So with the Clarity Coalition, what we're doing is we are all coming together and we are all supporting each other, journalists, politicians, activists, everybody. Um, and we all come together and we all support each other in the different work that we're doing so that we don't feel so alone. And so I just want to let your viewers know that the Clarity Coalition exists and that they can go check it out. It's claritycoalition.org. And it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. All that it matters is that you truly believe that Islamists are a problem in our societies and that we need to counter them. So is, Co is Clarity Coalition also uh, IRS approved 501c3? No, we are simply a coalition. We're just a group of people that all support each other. We, we had a conference last year in, in Salzburg, Austria, where we all got together and, uh, and shared our experiences. And, but, but it's not a, a formal organization like that at all. It is just a, a place for us to all have a, a, a place where we can feel safe and secure and supported. So let me know about your next conference. I'd like to come. I would and, love and, that. That's how yeah, and, and, uh, and learn. I mean, I want to learn uh, from, yes. you know, because I always enjoy learning from other smart people and I think I'll meet some smart people there. So thank you so much, Yasmin. You are an amazing person. I want people to know that I met you on the internet. Uh, uh, you know, I just found you very interesting. And uh, you followed me, and so I wanted to know a little more about you. Then, then we connected, and and uh, your story is so compelling. I bought your book, read your book, uh, made uh, made a donation to your organization, and then said, you know what, we should take your story to a broader audience. And here we are. Uh, congratulations to you, and thank you for your time. And uh, may you be blessed. And uh, today is uh, uh, the shara. Uh, uh, the shara is uh, when the warrior when the warrior protecting society comes out and kills the demon. So this is, so this is a very good day for you. Day. This is a perfect day for it. you. So, so, so uh, uh, we have, we have our, you know, history, our itihas, our past stories about what happened. And on the, the Shara is the day we commemorate this sort of a victory, a victory against forces that are very negative, that are harming society. And the warriors come out and they win on this day. So you are a warrior and may, may the divine be with you. And thank you very much, for, you so much for everything. Namaste. Thank you, Rajivji. Namaste.